नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा What's Monday without some drama? Tonight we bring you the story of a spy, an Indian official caught spying for Pakistan. He was posted in Moscow. What did he do for Pakistan? How was he caught? And what does this episode mean for India? We'll cover all of that and more. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, the stage is set for the sham election, complete with terrorist proxies pretending to be political parties and leaders campaigning with camels and eggplants. In neighboring Maldives, the embattled president is pressing on with his India out agenda New Delhi will pull out its troops in the Philippines an open war between the current and former president over a constitutional amendment and talk of splitting the country into two in China a court has sentenced an Australian to death in South Korea another pardon for the Samsung boss in El Salvador the man dubbed as the world's coolest dictator claims that he's won the election in Northern Ireland they finally have a government after two years in Chile more than 100 people dead in wildfires and would you like a home delivery of your new home you can order one online that and more coming up the headlines first indian prime minister narendra modi sets the stage for the general election says he's confident that he will return to power for a third term prime minister modi promises big decisions in his next term including making india the third largest economic power in the world But Senegal will have to wait for elections its parliament debates dealing the presidential poll on Saturday president Macky Sall announced the postponement elections were scheduled for 25th of February the polls could be delayed by 6 months or even a year Singapore passes a new law which can jail sex offenders and criminals indefinitely convicts can now be kept behind bars even after their jail terms end Singapore has tough laws for even minor offenses like vandalism which can be punished by caning Hong Kong government demands answers over Lionel Messi no show. They had repeatedly requested the superstar to play a sell out match on Sunday but Messi stayed on the bench leaving 40,000 fans angry. Some of them had paid over $600 to watch Messi in action. And Taylor Swift sings her way into the record books at the Grammys. She wins her fourth album of the year, the most by any artist ever. Miley Cyrus and Billie Eilish were the other big winners. India Zakir Hussain and Shankar Mahadevan won the best global album. Our lead story tonight has the makings of a Bollywood blockbuster, but with an anti-climax. An Indian has been caught spying for Pakistan. His name is Satendra Satendra Sival. a 28 year old security official he was posted at the indian mission in moscow he said to have taken money from an isi handler what for to steal confidential documents and leak them to pakistan it is shocking but hardly surprising he is not the first pakistani spy caught by india he won't be the last since independence both india and pakistan have spied on each other there's only one rule in this game don't get caught when you do all bets are off Tonight we'll tell you how this man was caught and what this case tells us about how the ISI operates that's the inter services intelligence the key intelligence agency slash dirty works department of pakistan ISI handlers use money and honey traps for recruitment earlier such operations were limited to india's high commission in pakistan but now they are being extended to indian missions in friendly countries too all they have to do is spot a vulnerability in this case it was money That was the case with Satendra Sival. He hails from the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. Three years back, he was posted to Moscow. The appointment was done by the MEA, India's Ministry of External Affairs. The ministry runs a bureau of security. This bureau recruits security assistants. Usually, they come from the Indian police force, constables and head constables. They are chosen to serve at Indian missions abroad to look after the security of the mission and the staff working there. That is their job. and in this case it was a deputation the tenure is usually for 3 years out of which an officer must spend at least 2 years overseas so in 2021 satendra sival was sent to moscow on deputation as a security assistant it's not clear when the isi turned him 
But recently, he came on the radar of Indian security agencies. They got intel that Satendra Siwal was a spy. They suspected that he was passing sensitive information to an ISI handler. This was linked to India's defense and foreign ministry, also India's military establishment. The charge is that he sold India's secrets to Pakistan and that he was in touch with a female ISI handler who lured him with money. Apparently, Sival spoke with this handler on the phone on a regular basis. And what kind of information did he give away? According to one report, he had access to intel about the movement and deployment of Indian troops, which is very sensitive information. Sival's only temptation, we are told, was money. He had multiple exchanges with his handler in Pakistan. On the basis of this intel, he was put under electronic surveillance. And when the details came out, he was grilled by Indian officials. Reports say he has confessed to spying for Pakistan. So the formal charges will follow. And what are the charges against Sival? Waging a war against the nation. He has been arrested under sections of this act, waging war against the nation. Also the Official Secrets Act. Investigators have recovered two mobile phones from him. They're going through his bank account now to assess how much money he got from Pakistan. But our story tonight is not just about this case. It's about the larger pattern. Pakistan is ramping up its psy ops. Last year alone, at least three such cases came to light. One of them involved a DRDO official. DRDO is the Defense Research and Development Organization. It does R&D for the Indian military. Now, this official, who was caught, was accused of passing information to Pakistani agents. And Pakistan has a long history of such operations. In 2017, India recalled three diplomats. They worked at the Indian High Commission in Islamabad. Reports say they were targeted for a honey trap. But the bid was foiled. Then in 2010, another Indian diplomat was arrested. She too worked at the Indian High Commission in the press division. The diplomat was accused of passing classified documents to the ISI. And on every such occasion, India's response has been swift. Sival has been neutralized. But India needs to keep its guard up. Because when the ISA is not busy rigging Pakistani elections, it is trying to damage India in every possible way, sometimes using Indian citizens as weapons. <laughs> Another election in Pakistan. So busy times for their army. A lot of rigging and backroom discussions to be done. The voting is on Thursday, which is the 8th of February. And Tuesday is the final day of campaigning. Both Nawaz Sharif and Bilawal Bhutto are holding rallies. Their rival Imran Khan is in jail. So do not expect a tight contest. But do expect drama. Any campaign's last stage is often the most exciting. And in Pakistan, it's no different. So let's look at the top five developments. Number one, the rallies. Nawaz Sharif was in the city of Murray. It's a mountain resort in the Punjab province. It snowed there over the weekend, so the Sharifs arrived to freezing temperatures. Yet a lot of people turned up. Thousands of supporters lined up along the streets. Nawaz Sharif treated them to a special listen-in. I I love you too. और मरी मरी को कह रहा हूँ मरी I love you और लोगों को कह रहा हूँ I love you I love you too if you love me Nawaz Sharif also loves you well the good news is this Pakistan's army loves him too at least for now Bilawal Bhutto also had a couple of busy days he was in Karachi today before that he was in the city of Hyderabad in Pakistan Hyderabad in Pakistan in both places he had the same message. Vote for me and bury the politics of revenge and hatred.
So Sharif and Bhutto are campaigning and Imran Khan, well, still in jail. Chances are he'll be there for a long time because this weekend he was convicted again and you won't believe why. A local court says Imran Khan's marriage is quote-unquote un-Islamic. So he and his wife have been sentenced to prison. For how long? Seven years each. And we thought we'd seen it all. Nonetheless, his party is motoring on. Their campaign videos show a sizable support base. Development number two, Pakistan's election commission has finally woken up. It has decided to rein in the caretaker regime. They were planning a big move, the caretaker government. They were planning to sell Pakistan's flag carrier, the PIA, the Pakistan International Airlines. It was bleeding money, so the caretaker government wanted to sell it. But the poll body has intervened. It has reportedly stopped the sale. And you can imagine why. A caretaker's job is to keep the government running, not to sell state assets. So for now, the sale is on hold. Development number three, a major security incident. Terrorists attacked a police station in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Around 10 policemen were killed. Six others were injured. It's not clear who launched these attacks, but the obvious suspect is the Pakistani Taliban. They have launched similar attacks in the past. The question is, will they do the same on voting day? It's entirely possible. And our next development will tell you why. Number four, the rise of terror parties. One of them is the Pakistan Markazi Muslim League. It's a proxy of 2611 mastermind Hafiz Saeed. Most of their candidates belong to two groups. They're either related to Saeed or they're linked to banned groups like the lashkar e toiba or the jamaat ud dawa Since those groups cannot contest elections, the Markazi League was made a proxy. Among their candidates is Hafiz Saeed's son. He's running for a, from a constituency in Lahore. Now I know what you're thinking. It's just one party. Well, it's not. Let me introduce the TLP, the Tehreek-e Labek Pakistan. It's a hardline Islamist party with links to extremism. And what's their campaign pitch? Listen in yourself. Today, Taliban came and where is the currency of Afghanistan? اللہ کی ذات پر ہمیں مومن ہے ہمیں بھروسہ ہونا چاہیے اور جب اسلام تخت پر آئے گا تو انشاءاللہ یہ سب چیزیں ختم ہو جائیں گی تھاؤزنز اف پیپل اٹینڈڈ دیئر ریلی سو یو کین ناٹ کال اٹ فرنج اٹ شوز ہاؤ ریڈیکلائز پاکستان ہیز بیکم بٹ ڈو ناٹ وری اٹس ناٹ آل ڈارک اینڈ گلومی اوور دیئر ویو سین سم لائٹر مومنٹس ٹو سم بائی ڈیزائن سم می بی ناٹ لائک دس مین ہوز کیمپیننگ آن اے کیمل ہی کلیمس ٹو ریپرزینٹ فارمرز اور دس گائے Mr. Eggplant. His name is Amir Mughal. He's campaigning with an eggplant in his hand. You may ask why, because that's his election symbol. <laughs> Amir Mughal is one of Imran Khan's many supporters. Since they lost their bat symbol, they have taken new ones. In this case, an eggplant. So that's the story of Pakistan's elections. A lot of rhetoric, a lot of fear, but not a lot of hope. The army is clearly backing the Sharifs to win. Only a miracle can prevent that. On to the Maldives now. President Mohamed Muizu has got what he wanted. He asked Indian soldiers to leave his country. Well, they're leaving. Indian and Maldivian officials met over the weekend. Afterwards, Male released a statement. It says, New Delhi has agreed to pull its soldiers. Some context now. India has around 80 soldiers in the Maldives. Their job is to maintain and operate aircraft. Three of them donated by New Delhi. But Mohammed Muizu wanted the soldiers out, and he set a deadline, March 15. Now, India's statement does not mention this deadline or even a withdrawal. This is what it says, I'm quoting, both sides agreed on a set of mutually workable solutions to enable continued operation of Indian aviation platforms. No mention of soldiers, no mention of a withdrawal. But Mali is not waiting around. Their president has already made the announcement, and that too in his first address to parliament. As agreed in the latest negotiations, the military personnel is one of the three aviation platforms which will be withdrawn before March 10, 2024. And the military personnel on the remaining two platforms will be withdrawn before May 10, 2024. So what's the plan here? For starters, the withdrawal will be staggered. The first batch will leave by March 10, the rest will leave by May 10. In their place, civilians will manage the planes, sort of like a swap. Indian soldiers out, Indian civilians in. 
So Moizu should be happy. He campaigned on the plank of India out. He's finally done it. The question is, at what cost? Just look at his parliament address today. Guess how many lawmakers attended it? 24 out of 80. 24 out of 80 in attendance. The rest of the MPs decided to boycott the president's address. And they had many reasons to do so. Among them was Moizu's anti-India rhetoric. So the president is playing a dangerous game. His big test will be in March, next month. That's when parliamentary elections will be held in the Maldives. It could be a referendum on his pivot. Not just away from India, but also towards China. That's where he's taking his country. This week, Mali is hosting a Chinese research vessel. It's called Xiang Yang Hong 3. Many experts say it's a spy vessel. But the Maldives does not think so. They're calling it a routine voyage. No research or studying, only restocking and personal change. But India is worried. Similar Chinese vessels docked in Sri Lanka recently. Back then, New Delhi raised objections. So chances are it will object again, which brings us to Moizu's end goals. What is he trying to do? Is this just about sovereignty and soldiers, or, is, or has this become personal? His parliament address offered some clues. Listen in. I believe that modern military capability to defend the country by road, sea and air should be strengthened in the Maldives. We have started to do that now, if God wills. The Maldivian Defence Force will soon be able to conduct the surveillance of the 900,000 square kilometre exclusive economic zone of the Maldives 24 hours a day. So Moizu wants self-reliance. He wants a strong military. But why antagonise India for that? Why turn your most important neighbour into a villain? It's a strategy that could backfire. Moizu's opposition has already warned him. That's the MDP, the Maldivian Democratic Party, the key opposition. Their leaders say an impeachment motion is being prepared. We don't know when it will be filed, but the MDP says within this parliamentary term, meaning before the 17th of March. So Moizu needs a rethink because India and China are powerful countries. They can handle big power rivalries. But can the Maldives? Can it afford to get caught in between? It's a question for President Moizu. As for India, it's a game of few options, really. You can't overstay your welcome in any country. If you do, local sentiments change. So I guess a withdrawal was the only option for India. Having said that, it's not game over. Because this is a long strategic battle. Sometimes you have to take a step back to move forward. Just look at what happened in Sri Lanka. India played the long game. India helped Colombo when crisis came and now relations are better. In fact, an Indian submarine docked in Colombo last week. The INS Karanj. It's a Calvary class diesel electric submarine. It was in Sri Lanka for the country's Independence Day celebrations. Compare that to China. Beijing wanted to send spy ships to Sri Lanka. At first, Colombo agreed, but when India objected, they stopped the voyage. Sri Lanka has banned research ships for one year. So New Delhi has a template to follow. And that template is quite simple. India's commitment is not to Muizu or his party. It is to the people of the Maldives. Because leaders come and go, but memories of cooperation and friendship remain. In the Philippines, a constitutional crisis has erupted, and it's so serious that it threatens to break the country apart. A former president is up in arms. He is taking on, on his own political ally. We're talking about Rodrigo Duterte. He's on the war path against the current president. Listen to this. When I was the mayor, the drug enforcement office showed me a list. Your name was there, but I don't want to expose you because you're a friend. We know each other. But you started. You entered into a conflict. Mr. President, you might follow the fate of your father. And what I was afraid of, it will divide the nation. It will be a bloody time. That statement is from last week. Duterte is taking aim at Marcos Jr., the current president of the Philippines. Marcos Jr. Until recently, Duterte and Marcos Jr. were allies. In fact, Duterte's daughter, Sarah, is the current vice president of the Philippines. She works with Marcos Jr. She is his deputy. But her father is now an adversary of the president. Why? For power. That's what it boils down to. It's a fight for power. And this is how it began. Marcos Jr. wants to change the constitution. 
There is speculation that he may tinker with the presidential term limits. Here's what the current constitution says. You can remain president for only one, one term, that's six years. You cannot return after that, not even after a gap. You can be president only once. Apparently, Marcos Jr. wants to change that, or so Duterte says. And if that happens, it will be a controversial step, especially given the history of this country. Marcos Jr. is the son of Ferdinand Marcos, the infamous director of the Philippines. He remained in power for two decades. His reign lasted till the 1980s. He was ousted after a revolt, a massive uprising against the regime. It led to revisions in the constitution. And term limits were set. You could be the president only for one term. This was designed to keep dictators like Marcos Sr. away. But now his son may want to do away with these limits. He's not saying it in so many words, but he's not addressing the controversy either. He's not denying it. All that the president has said is this. He wants to uplift the economy, and the current constitution does not allow it. It does not allow reform, which is why he wants certain amendments. And such statements are only adding to the anxiety. The president says he wants to relax some economic provisions, and the current constitution of the Philippines restricts foreign investment. Marcos Jr. wants to lift these curbs to get more FDI or foreign direct investment into the Philippines. In fact, I have a quote from him. This is what he says. The 1987 constitution was not written for a globalized world, and that's where we are now. We have to adjust so we, we can increase economic activity in the Philippines. That's all he's saying for now. But in the past, he has backed the idea of wider reforms. And that's what Duterte says he's worried about. So he's openly fighting the president, calling him a drug addict and hurling abuses at him. Reject. Reject. Protect the constitution. I'm calling now the armed forces and police. Don't forget our civilians. Don't think of one family only. Son of Last week he proposed something radical. Duterte wants to break up his country. His hometown is an island called Mindanao. It is in southern Philippines. Duterte said a signature campaign is underway in Mindanao. Voters are being asked if the island should be split from the Philippines. Now, these are radical and disturbing developments. And what is Manila's reaction? It may send in the military. The country's national security advisor has spoken. He says, and I'm quoting, any attempt to secede will be met by the government with resolute force. The official did not name former President Duterte, but the warning was clearly meant for him. And this is serious. Also because of Mindanao's volatile past. In the Philippines, you see, most citizens are Catholics. But Mindanao has a significant Muslim population, and this island has witnessed decades of fighting. Since the 1960s, more than 120,000 people have died here, mainly due to separatism. In 2017, a martial law was implemented here, imposed here, and this was after violent clashes had erupted between Islamic separatists and the Philippine army. The island has been a hotbed of ISIS activity too. The movement was violently crushed by Duterte himself when he was president. So by proposing to split the country in Mindanao, Duterte is playing with fire. These are the makings of turbulent times for the Philippines. And staying in the region, a new flashpoint has emerged between China and Australia. They've had a difficult last few years. Australia was the first country to demand a global investigation into the origins of the Wuhan virus. China did not take it well. A trade war erupted that hurt Australia more than China. Then in 2022, a Labour government came to power in Canberra. They tried to mend ties. They made overtures to stabilize the relationship. But today, a verdict from Beijing could undo all the progress. A Chinese court has sentenced an Australian to death. He was detained in 2019. Beijing says he's a spy. Canberra has called the verdict appalling. Our next report has all the details. The year was 2019. Yang Hengju had arrived in China's Guangzhou. It was supposed to be a normal day, but within moments, everything changed. 
Yang was intercepted by Chinese officials and taken away. Since then, he's been in China's custody, subjected to torture and denied proper legal representation. After a secret trial, China declared Yang is a spy. Today, they announced his punishment, five years after he was arrested. Yang has been handed a suspended death sentence. He was found guilty of espionage and sentenced to death with two years probation, and it was ordered that all his personal properties be confiscated. The reaction in Canberra has been sharp. The Australian government summoned the Chinese ambassador and demanded an explanation. The Labour government is promising a tough response. We understand that this can be committed to a life sentence following two years. The Australian government is appalled at this outcome. We will be commuting, communicating our response in the strongest terms. But these assurances will hardly be any consolation for Yang's family. Yang's sons are in Australia. They say his health is failing and China is denying him medical treatment. When Anthony Albanese travelled to China last year, Yang's sons had written to the Prime Minister, asking him to secure their father's release. While the visit was fruitful in breaking the ice, Canberra was unable to secure Yang's release. Because Beijing wanted to settle some scores. Yang used to live in China. He even worked for the Chinese state at the Ministry of State Security. In 2000, he immigrated to Australia. After leaving China, he developed his reputation as a prominent critic. He spoke out against China's human rights abuses and advocated for democracy. Yang had even written spy novels that featured China's vast espionage apparatus. Before his detention, Yang had become restrained in his criticism. He was being more cautious in his public statements. But Beijing still went after him when they got the chance. China's order put Yang's future in doubt and the detente between China and Australia in jeopardy. So we actually have very little information um, about what it is that Yang is alleged to have done. Um, and this really, I think, shines a spotlight on the opaqueness of China's criminal justice system, especially when it comes to national security violations. Detention of Australians in China have soured ties in the past. Last year, China released Cheng Li, a journalist, She's now back in Australia after spending more than three years in Chinese captivity. Cheng Tu was accused of espionage. Her release would have given the Yang family some hope, but today's verdict has crushed it. So China's courts are too strict, borderline draconian. But South Korea faces a different problem, that of being too lenient. Let me explain. A court in Seoul handed out a surprise verdict today. It acquitted Samsung's top boss, Lee Jae-yong. Now, the case dates back to 2015. Lee merged two Samsung affiliates, Samsung c and and Chiel Industries. But the merger was not squeaky clean. Prosecutors said the deal was done to strengthen Lee's position. They said he cooked the books. But today, he's been let off. It's a big relief for Lee because the 2015 merger was like his kryptonite. The same case got him jailed in 2017. Back then, the charges were different. Lee was accused of bribing the former South Korean president. Her name was Park Gwyn Hai. Lee offered her $6.4 million. In return, he wanted government approval for this merger. Lee was sentenced to five years in jail. But 18 months later, he was out. In 2021, he was arrested again. Same case different charges. And once again, he was sentenced to prison. But months later, Lee walked out on parole, and one year later, the South Korean president pardoned him. If this isn't fishy, I don't know what is. One man, one dirty merger, many convictions, but somehow he escapes all of it. The question is how? To understand that, we must understand Samsung. For you and me, it's just a company. But in South Korea, it's a lot more. Samsung and its affiliates make up 20% of South Korea's stock exchange, 18% of the entire GDP, and 17% of total exports. I know the numbers are impressive, but Samsung's influence goes beyond statistics. 
Name any industry, chances are Samsung is part of it. Hospitals, medical centers, schools, textiles, electronics, universities, construction, insurance, Samsung has its fingers in all of these pies. As a result, you cannot escape Samsung if you live in South Korea. It's not just another company, it's part of your daily life. But how did Samsung reach this position? The story begins in 1938. Samsung started out as a grocery trading store. It was founded by this man, Lee Byung-Chul. Samsung would produce noodles and export them to China. That was their first business. But the Korean War changed everything. South Korea was devastated by the fighting, so the country had to be rebuilt. And Lee jumped at the opportunity. From the late 1950s, he went on a buying spree. Lee bought three commercial banks, a cement company, a fertilizer firm, an insurance company, textile mills, a department store, and an oil refinery. South Korea's policies helped Lee do all of this. Back then, the regime was protectionist. It wanted to help South Korean businesses grow, to shield them from outside competition. Such businesses have a name in Korea. They're called Chebol. Basically, large family-owned businesses. And Samsung was one of them. By the late 1960s, Lee ventured into the world of electronics. His first product? Black and white televisions. Then came an aerospace division. Then information technology. Then telecommunications and nanotechnology. So Samsung was rising fast. By 1987, Lee passed away. The company was split into five. Lee's eldest son got the electronics division. His name was Lee Kun Hee. Now, Lee Jr. brought in a big attitude change. He once told his employees, change everything but your wife and kids. And for a while, it worked. Product quality improved. The bottom line was looking good. But beneath all that was a toxic corporate culture. For example, bribing was a big problem. In 1996, Lee himself was charged. He bribed the then president of South Korea. His son did the same in 2015. But both father and son were pardoned. And through all of this, Samsung kept growing. Today, it's a corporate giant. Until last year, it was the biggest smartphone maker in the world, even ahead of Apple, which is also why Samsung bosses get away with almost everything. You see, South Korea is eyeing the chip race. It wants a chunk of the semiconductor market, and for that, it needs Samsung. It needs Lee Jae Young at the top. Is it an ideal situation? Of course not. It is the definition of state capture and crony capitalism, but South Korea has no one to blame. They chose this path to growth. Now they must deal with the consequences. Have you heard of Naib? Bukele. He's El Salvador's president, also known as the world's coolest dictator. Bukele claims he has won the election with over 85% of the vote. The official results are yet to be announced, but Bukele says he is the winner and he is quite popular in El Salvador. He waged a war on gangs, which turned him into a national hero. Since 2022, Bukele's government has arrested more than 75,000 gangsters. Homicide levels have plummeted to an all time low. He is by far Latin America's most popular leader. But there are fears of human rights abuses and centralization of power. None of that seems to bother him, though. He says his next target is fixing the economy. Our next report tells you all about El Salvador's unapologetic dictator. A sharp beard, slicked back hair, a glossy leather motorcycle jacket, and a selfie with Lionel Messi. Naib Armando Bukele Ortez was only 37 when he became the president of El Salvador. An outsider in politics, he now calls himself the world's coolest dictator. Bukele was born in 1981 in the capital, San Salvador. He is of Palestinian heritage. He joined his father's textile business but soon ditched that for politics. He first served as the mayor of a San Salvador suburb then became the mayor of the capital, and in 2019, he became the president. He wrote the popular sentiment, marketing himself as the outsider candidate. He's also a social media whiz. He takes to X, formerly known as Twitter, to talk to voters. He posts on YouTube and Facebook, 
Unsurprisingly, he's also not a fan of criticism, but his fans love him. The people are devoted to him. He's almost a cult-like personality, often known as Latin America's most popular leader. What makes him particularly popular is his war on gangs. El Salvador has a long history of gang violence. In the last 30 years, it has claimed over 120,000 civilian lives. When Bukele took power, gangs controlled 80% of the country. But Bukele vowed to change that. In 2022, he introduced a state of emergency. 75,000 gangsters were rounded up. It didn't matter whether they were real or suspected. All of them were sent to prison. There were accusations of human rights abuses, allegations of authoritarianism. But none of that mattered to Bukele or to the people of El Salvador. That's because the country's homicide rate has plummeted. It was once the most dangerous in the world. Now it's at its lowest level in three decades, even lower than the global average. We have started to defeat our biggest evil. We are on the cusp of winning the war against the gangs. Literally, it's not an exaggeration. It's not a hyperbole. Literally, we went from being the most dangerous country in the world to being the most secure in all of the Western Hemisphere. But bringing gang violence under control is not the only thing that Bukele did. He also had the military storm the parliament. He replaced judges he considered hostile and oversaw the jailing of innocent people. But none of that affected his re-election bid. The official results are not out yet, but he claims to have won with 85% of the votes. A win that he calls a record in the entire democratic history of the world. In all the history of the world, since the existence of democracy, never has a project won with the quantity of votes that we have won. Literally, it's the highest percentage in all of history. The highest difference between first and second place in history. Salvadorians may have newfound peace, all thanks to Bukele's crackdown. But his second term will have new hurdles, like the economy. He may have an overwhelming second term mandate, but El Salvador's economy is fragile. There is high public debt. Over 30% of the population lives in poverty and consumer prices are rapidly rising. Salvadorians may be getting used to living without fear, but if Bukele doesn't act fast on the economy, the honeymoon period may soon come to an end. Our next story is from Northern Ireland. They're witnessing a historic moment. They finally have a government after two years, and that too led by a nationalist. Her name is Michelle O'Neill. She's the first, the new first minister. She belongs to pro-United Ireland party called Sinn Féin. And why is this a historic moment? Because for the first time in 100 years, the top job is held by a nationalist. What does that mean? To understand that, we have to go back in history. The year was 1921, Ireland was partitioned. One part was the Republic of Ireland. It got independence from Britain the next year. The other part, was what we know as Northern Ireland. It remained within Britain, but tensions simmered on between two parties, the Unionists who were loyal to the British Crown and the Nationalists who wanted a united Ireland. These two parties often clashed. By the 1960s, things turned bloody. The police got involved. There was rampant conflict over three decades. Finally, in 1998, they signed the Good Friday Agreement, a deal that gave Northern Ireland a unique style of governance where both the sides, unionists and nationalists, share power. They run the government together. Whichever side gets more votes elects the first minister. That's what their leader is called, the first minister. The side with lesser votes chooses the deputy first minister. In 2022, the nationalists got more votes. That's the Sinn Féin. They swept the polls. It was a significant message from the voters. This party has a violent past. They've been associated with the Irish Republican Army, IRA, a paramilitary organization fighting for a united Ireland. In fact, O'Neill herself has links to the IRA. Her father was jailed for being an IRA member. Her uncle raised money for the IRA. One of her cousins was killed by a British elite regiment. So her election is a big deal. Assembly for all. Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. Despite our different outlooks and our different views in the future constitutional position, the public rightly demand 
that we, that we work together and that we deliver together. And also that we must build trust and confidence in our ability to collectively do that. That said, it's highly symbolic. You see, she may be called First Minister, but she must share power equally with the Deputy First Minister. The titles may be different, but the powers are the same. Which also brings us to the question, if this party won in 2022, why are they coming to power now? Like the root of all problems in the UK, the answer here too is Brexit. After the UK left the European Union, Northern Ireland was left with a problem. It shared a border with, a, with an EU country, the Republic of Ireland. So the two sides needed border checks, especially for trade. But the UK was wary of touching that border given the long history of conflict. So it decided to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol. And what is that? Any product traveling between Britain and Ireland would be checked at Northern Ireland instead. This angered the Unionists. They said it undermined Ireland's position. So after the 2022 election, they refused to allow government formation. Negotiations began first with the Boris Johnson government, then with Rishi Sunak's government. The impasse continued until last Thursday. That's when they finally agreed to a deal. It will end post-Brexit checks on goods. It will also secure Northern Ireland's position in the UK. So finally, after two years, the deadlock has ended. The Northern Ireland Assembly is back in action, and they have a nationalist at the helm. O'Neill says a united Ireland is within touching distance. What does that mean? Very little beyond the symbolism. You see, this was a long impasse. With its end, Northern Ireland has its task cut out to fix its struggling health and public services. They're more likely to focus on running the government than changing their status, at least for now. Now let's talk about online shopping. You can buy pretty much ev anything online. Groceries, makeup, bags, cars, and now even homes. If you're dreaming about your home being delivered to your doorstep, this story is for you. And your dream may soon come true because Amazon is delivering houses. They're tiny, foldable, and affordable. You can get them for around $12,500, and if it sounds too good to be true, our next report helps you calibrate your expectations. Picture this. You're strolling through Amazon, hunting for the latest deals. New gadgets, maybe a quirky mug. And suddenly you stumble upon a section. It says housing. You click on it, and what do you find? Foldable homes. Welcome to the era where your dream home is just a prime delivery away. Because why build when you can unfold? Currently, it's available only in select countries like the United States. It ranges from $12,500 to $30,000. It's foldable, but once upright, it's just like a small home. With two bedrooms, one living room, one bathroom and a kitchen. There's full electrical wiring, hot and cold water, drainage and insulation pipes. A TikToker who bought it says it took about 20 minutes for five men to fully unfurl the house. So are these foldable homes really the answer to our housing woes? Or are we falling into the trap of convenience gone crazy? First, imagine a home being just clicks away. Home ownership is a monumental process. This reduces it to just a click. Hit buy and check out. The question is, should any life-changing decision come with two-day shipping? Imagine unboxing your new home like a giant Lego set. You're not just building a structure, you're constructing your future. And let's not overlook the potential hazards. DIY home construction may sound cool, but one misplaced move and suddenly your living room is also your dining room. But there are some pros. These are easy to assemble, which means they're easy to take down as well. You can travel with them, and they're also more disaster resistant, which means they can survive storms, floods, hurricanes, and excess snowfall. So the idea of purchasing a foldable home may seem appealing. After all, it's like an adventure. You can get lost in a maze of multiple options and multiple configurations. But it does raise some important questions. How much do we value our living spaces? Are we sacrificing the sacred process of building homes for convenience? Will foldable homes be a revolution in the housing market 
or just another fold in the world of consumerism and convenience. Chile is on fire, quite literally. An inferno is raging there. Parts of the country have been swallowed by wildfires. More than 100 people have lost their lives. Thousands more have become homeless and large swathes of land have been reduced to ash. The president has declared an emergency. The military has been called in in the South American country as it battles its worst disaster in more than a decade. Here's a report. This is what large parts of central Chile look like. Neighborhoods scorched, cars and vehicles charred, and over 100 people dead. Hundreds of others are still missing. Chile is facing its worst disaster of the past decade. Given the tragic conditions, the number of victims will surely rise in the coming hours. The fires are sweeping through hilly areas, Plumes of smoke were seen rising from buildings and forests, blanketing the sky. The wildfires that began several days ago gathered momentum on Friday. They have ravaged the outer edges of Viña del Mar and Valparaiso. These are Chile's two coastal cities that are popular with tourists. Between them, they have over one million residents. But the deadly blaze has now forced many of them to flee their houses. The fires have destroyed more than a thousand homes. After the fire was brought under control, residents returned to their charred homes to salvage what little they could from the ashes. But almost everything was destroyed. It was all lost. It was all burnt. There is nothing left. The fires have also had a devastating impact on the country's historical sites. A famous botanical garden founded in 1931 was devoured by the flames. As Chile battles this crisis, President Boric declared Monday and Tuesday as days of national mourning for the victims. I want to communicate that I have decreed a national mourning for two days, starting tomorrow, February 5th, because it's Chile as a whole that is suffering and crying for our deceased. The president has also declared a state of emergency. Authorities have imposed a nighttime curfew to bring the situation under control. There are currently more than 160 active fires burning across the country. That's according to Chile's National Disaster Prevention and Response Service. Firefighters are battling to quell the fires, but unusually high temperatures, low humidity and high-speed winds have made their task difficult. The military has also been called in to help the firefighters with helicopters dumping water to douse the raging flames. The fires come as Chile battles a summer heat wave. The capital, Santiago, is sweltering. Temperatures have climbed above 33 degrees Celsius in the region. But wildfires are not all that uncommon in Chile. Last year, some 27 people died and more than 400,000 hectares of land was destroyed due to it. But this year, it's even more severe. Other than the ecological and humanitarian crises, there is also a financial aspect to these wildfires. Damages in the Valparaiso region will likely amount to hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's just preliminary estimates. But this is not just Chile's problem. Forest fires have intensified around the globe. Colombia has seen dozens of fires erupt in recent weeks. It's the same story in Argentina, Venezuela and Ecuador as well. And the El Nino weather phenomena, which warms the ocean surface, has only made matters worse. There's more bad news in store. The situation is unlikely to improve in the future. According to the United Nations, the number of extreme wildfire events will increase to 14% by 2030. As Chile battles this crisis, it is another stark reminder for the world of how climate change is upending lives. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In India, heavy snowfall turns Kashmir's Gulmarg into a winter wonderland. In Germany, a musician played the piano hanging from a crane. And China is gearing up for the year of the dragon with dancing dragons.
We're also taking you back in history on this day in 1907. The world's first synthetic plastic was invented. It was called Bakelite. This ushered the age of plastic. It was used to make everything from jewelry to washing machines. And before we go, here's our newest offering to you. At 10 p.m. IST, which is right after this show, catch the first episode of First Post America. First of its kind newscast live from Washington, D.C., where we get you stories from the United States and across the world. Make sure you don't miss it. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Special characteristics and properties. People of resonoid products. For the manufacturer, artist, designer, and amateur craftsman, they have opened up a new field of wide possibilities. And for the public, new means of decoration and service. This jet necklace, madam, is Bakelite Resonoid. We consider it equal if materials, for example, are prepared as powders, molding flakes, board stock, and blanks. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Pulse America.